so here's what I want to do uh, this afternoon with you guys is I want to tell you a story about a guy just like you all um, named Tommy Tosh. He was a Sigma Nu here about 17 years ago, and he came to crew one night. The Sigma Nu's brought him to crew, and I'm going to use Tommy to kind of talk to you about what it means to know God in a personal way. Tommy came down after crew one night, and he asked me if we could go to lunch. So we went to lunch the next day, and Tommy said this to me. He said, Isaac, um, I'm miserable. I'm not happy. I don't like to get out of the bed. Um, I'm in a fraternity. I've got a girlfriend. You know, basically, what's my problem? And I began to ask Tommy some questions that somebody asked me several years earlier when I was in a setting in a meeting like this. Um, matter of fact, let me just tell you briefly, my senior year I was a Simicide, Arkansas, and God just really began to work in my life, and I decided I wanted to work with fraternity guys for the next several years. I just didn't know it would turn into, this is my 24th year now of working with fraternity guys, and that my heart is just to help you guys grow spiritually. So I really love the opportunity to sit down with Tommy that day. Well, I began to have a conversation with him that went really well, and I want to fast forward. A few years later, Tommy became one of our student leaders with crew. Um, he was coming on staff with Crew the next year. He had even made his 70 Sigma Nu pledges read a book called More Than a Carpenter. And one Wednesday, we got together over at the house, and um, we, we were following up some of the Sigma Nu uh, pledges and the actives and uh, had a great afternoon of ministry together. But I didn't know it, but that'd be the last day I'd ever see Tommy because that Friday, he got in a car with some of our other Greek students, a Fidel a DG and a few other girls and they were heading up to the Kentucky game and right outside Nashville an 18 wheeler pulled out in front of them and Tommy was thrown from the car and uh, they actually picked up a cell phone out of the rubble called me um, I jumped in the car with some DGs and we headed up to Nashville and I held his hand in the hospital as he, as he was dying and that was really hard for me to lose him because we had gotten so close I've actually lost three students involved a crew over the years but you guys, even though I lost a great friend, I had a total peace about where Tommy was because of a conversation that we had. And um, Tommy didn't know this, but two months, about two months before he was to pass, he came down to a Greek leadership project that I do down in Destin every summer, which I'd love for you guys to pray about coming to. It's called the Greek Summit. It's from May 10th to about May 24th. And during that time, we train you to be spiritual leaders in your fraternity and sororities. We have students from all over the South. I know some of these guys have come to it. And while he was down there, we videoed his testimony. And like I said, we didn't know it, but this would be two or three months before he passed. And we have it. So I'm going to play it for you. It's about two, mo uh, two minutes long. And if you can kind of get to where you can see this, I'm going to show it to you, okay? My name's Tommy. This is just uh, a little bit about how Christ has uh, changed my life. Uh, I grew up in a family. Uh, pretty good, good Christian family, just a uh, close-knit family, uh, pretty active in my youth group, but never really knew what it was meant to just be a Christian, and uh, went on to college. It was just a struggle to get out of bed each day, because I would uh, get in bed at night just hoping the day wouldn't come, and uh, wake up and not want to move, and uh, just really was searching for something to uh, just bring me joy. So I went through uh, first semester of freshman year just not, just not pleased with my life and uh, was introduced to a lot of uh, great guys in my fraternity that uh, were pretty close with Isaac and uh, just began to kind of hang around those guys and uh, just see the kind of lifestyles they lived. So I just kind of, I guess towards, I guess April or April and May, just really sat on the question of asking Christ, you know, why are these guys just so, so joyful and what is it they have, what is it that they have that, you know, that would, would give me the same joy in my life as them. And I just kind of sat on that question all summer and uh, got back to school, just really, just ready to just, to take a big step and I uh, met with Isaac. It was September 1st, and we went over the uh, four spiritual laws, and uh, that afternoon I accepted Christ, and it's just been uh, just unbelievable since then. Uh, just the, the joy and just the inner peace that he's uh, just put in my life is unbelievable. Just being filled with the Spirit is, is, is like nothing else. Uh, just letting Christ take hold of your life, and uh, just having him... Uh, be with you as you share with others and uh, 
that's something I, I really just am looking forward to in the future, just uh, sharing with others and bringing them to Christ. There's two things Tommy says in, the te in his testimony there that are kind of significant. One is he looked up to a few Sigma News that he really respected that were involved with us. And these guys, I knew these guys really well, and they were men of character. They were men, uh, they were just had a high honor about themselves, and they were leaders uh, as far as character in the fraternity, and he looked up to them. And my challenge to you guys in here, KAs as freshmen, is that you would really think about what type of man do I want to become? What type of man do I want to be? And girls, that you would think about that, and that you would live your lives in such a way that you can influence the people behind you like Tommy. Well, and then Tommy says at the end of the video, he can't wait to start telling people about Christ. We had no idea that through his death now, thousands and thousands of Ole Miss students like you all have come through this university over the last 13 years since he passed, and we tell the same story to all the fraternities and sororities about Tommy. Now, I want to talk to you about the conversation we had over lunch, and if you have that booklet, I want to show it to you. Now, if you and I were getting lunch, I might not pull the booklet out. Um, I might sit there and just talk to you. I might carry my Bible with me. And by the way, a Sigma Nu every summer takes the money that he earns over the summer and he buys a thousand Bibles for us to give to you guys. So that's why we have that Bible for you guys. Um, it's an NIV. It's a, it's a great uh, translation. If you end up, you got a Bible, uh, please still take it with you because I don't want them in my garage and you can give it to somebody else. But do we have an extra one of those booklets that I want to talk to you about? You have an extra one over here? <coughs> okay. Um, so a couple questions I asked Tommy as we sat there and talked, and if you and I got lunch together or we were sitting around talking over coffee, two questions I would ask you that somebody got me thinking about when I was a little younger than you all was this. First question is, on a scale from zero to 100, if something was to happen to you and you were to die, how sure would you be that you would go to heaven? And I've been doing this, this is the 28th year I've been in the Greek system, and I've had this conversation with hundreds and hundreds of students over the years, so I have a pretty good idea what a lot of you would say to me. It would be like what Tommy said. You'd say, well, I'm about 50% sure, maybe 70% sure. You know, I'm not sure. The next question I would ask you then is if you stood before God and he was to ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom, what would you say? Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to ask us that question. But it gives me an idea of what you think it takes to get to heaven. And most students begin to kind of give me their spiritual portfolio. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Methodist or um, you know, I've really done some good things and I did this and that. And, and all those things are great, but that's really not what I'm looking for. And with Tommy, I said, do you mind if I kind of walk you through these four points a guy named Dr. Bright, who started Crusade maybe 60 years ago, wrote this down so people could have something to look at. So if you've got it, just kind of open it up. If you don't have one, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Do you guys, y'all have one all in the back? We got one. We need some more just right up here if we can, Bill. Thanks. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through just these simple four points. I'm going to back it up with some scripture, and then I'm going to pray for us, okay? That's basically what we're going to do together. If you'll look at the booklet on page two there, there's the first point, and it says, God loves you, and he created you to know him personally. And I shared these things with Tommy, and the next verse over is John 3.16, probably a verse many of you are familiar with, but when I read it to Tommy, I said this, For God so loved Tommy that he gave his only begotten son, that if Tommy will believe in him, he will not perish but have eternal life. So I told Tommy that day, if you'll believe in God, you can have eternal life. The next verse that I actually read to him that's not on this page was John 10, 10. And G it says, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And I asked Tommy, Tommy, why do you think you're not happy right now? Why do you think so many Ole Miss students are not happy? And he said, you know, I, I don't know. That's, that's really the question I have for you. And I said, well, let's flip over to the next page and see what this, this little booklet says here. Page two, point two says this. People are sinful and separated from God so we cannot know him personally or experience his love and plan. And if you'll flip over the top verse on the next page, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. The word sin is simply an archery term, which means to miss the mark, the bullseye. I started bow hunting when I was in college, and I love bow hunting. And I've killed a lot of animals with my bow, okay? but I've missed a lot of animals. And when I miss an animal, when I miss that kill zone, no matter how far outside I miss that deer or that uh, fox or whatever I'm shooting at, it's, the word is sin. It means to miss the mark of perfection. And what the Bible says simply is that we've all missed the mark of perfection. That's why they chose this word when they translated the original Greek and Hebrew. 
The next verse down, Romans 6, 23, says, For the wages or the consequences of sin is death, which is spiritual separation from God. So imagine kind of like God's on one side of the Grand Canyon and we're on the other side of the Grand Canyon. And I know we try to do a lot of things to reach a holy God. Maybe we go to church or we do good or we try to help out other people. And all those things are great, but it's like running on our own and trying to be as good as we can to jump across the Grand Canyon and we'll never be good enough or strong enough to make it across. Well, the third point illustrates... What we believe and what I told Tommy, I believe, is the only way to get to Christ. And number three says, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for our sin. Through Him alone, we can know God personally and experience God's love and plan. Look at these verses, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates His own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, it doesn't say while we were yet good, while we were yet doing nice things for others. No, it says while we were yet sinful, and uh, Romans also says we were dead spiritually, Christ died for us to make us alive. Look down at John 14, 6. This, this comment right here that Jesus made, of course, he knew exactly what he was saying and why he was saying it. This is one of the things that in, ended up getting him killed because he says here, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Well, all right, if you'll flip over to the fourth and final point, this was the point that really sealed the deal for me. I'll use an illustration since we got the KA guys here. Um, I've read a lot about Robert E. Lee. I just finished reading Killer Angels two weeks ago because Monday I'm driving to Gettys or I'm flying to Gettysburg with a bunch of men to attend a leadership conference. And we're going to get to walk across the field that in 1864, 65, the entire Ole Miss men's uh, uh, class walked across and, and was killed at Pickett's Charge. And I'm going to get to see where that happened. But you see, I know a lot about Robert E. Lee, but I don't know Robert E. Lee. And when I heard this information for the first time, I had grown up most of my life going to a Baptist church, but it just never clicked for me. I never had anybody share it with me so simple, and I didn't realize that I had to say yes to Christ. It says here, look at this. All right, so four, fourth point says, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, then we can know God personally and experience His love and plan. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who receive him, to them he, uh, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So when you receive him and you say yes to him, you become his child. Some people will say to me, Isaac, that just seems too easy. It seems like you got to do this, this, and this. And I'll use marriage as an example. Uh, this past fall, I did my 33rd wedding. Almost every wedding I've done is from Ole Miss students. And to me, it's fascinating that I can stand at the front of a church and two people can come down front, a man and a woman, and look each other in the face and say, I do, and become married. You see, they're receiving each other. And Jesus talks a lot about marriage in the Bible because it's very symbolic of what we do to Him. It's nothing we deserve about it. There's nothing we do to earn it. We simply say yes to Him and no to us. And you see, the day I got married to my wife 21 years ago, that's what I said is no to me. It's not about me anymore, but it's about you and serving and loving you. Look at this next verse. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Last year I went on my 25th mission trip. I've been to Haiti, Honduras, Romania. My sister's a full-time missionary in Honduras. But we can't stand before God and say, Hey God, I'm ready to go to heaven. You know why you should let me in? It's because I've done so many missionary trips. You know what? I'm still sinful. I still need a Savior. No matter how much good I've done, my sister's done it all. She works in an orphanage full-time in Honduras. I mean, she's, she's left everything about the comforts of America to be a missionary. But that still can't get her to heaven. The way we get to heaven, as the Bible says, is through Christ. And the final verse at the top of that next page is Revelation 3.20. And it's actually John or Jesus speaking through John to the, the church of Laodicea. But I think that uh, our churches today could listen to this same verse because it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And I'm here to tell you today, if you don't feel like you're 100%, I believe you can be 100% before you leave this room. And I want to show you these two circles at the bottom here. I believe every one of you in this room are in one of these two circles. You see, the one on the left, they may be a good person. Uh, they may go to church regularly. But see, Christ is not in the circle. 
And I believe they're trusting in themselves to get to heaven. So there I believe, therefore, I believe they're 0% sure they're going to heaven because they're trusting in their own good deeds. Look at the person on the right. They may not be perfect. They may uh, have made mistakes this past week. They may have even slept in and not gone to church. But look who they're, they're trusting to pay the penalty for their sins. It's Christ. You, I want you to know that that day I shared this with Tommy. I went to the next page, which, the, which was the prayer, and I read the prayer with him, and I gave it to him, and I signed my name and number on it, and I gave it to Tommy, and he, he was a KD house boy. So we jumped in my truck, drove him over to the KD house, dropped him off, and I said, Tommy, I believe this is the most important decision you can ever make, more important than the wife you choose. And the last question I want to ask you is, who are you trusting to pay the penalty for your sins? Just think about that. Well, Tommy served over at the KD house, got a ride back to his car, jumped in his car, drove over to OU Methodist, and went and found Warren Black in his office. And he said, hey, Warren, here's what Isaac uh, shared with me today. What do you think? And Warren said, he's right on the money. Matter of fact, Warren and I became friends after that conversation. And Tommy went into the sanctuary at OU Methodist. He said, the lights are out. He made his way down the aisle, sat in the pew that he grew up in, and he said yes to Christ that afternoon. And Tommy called me. We got together, and that's how our friendship began. So that's why fast forward three years for, uh, later, when I got the news that Tommy had passed, I was totally at peace because I knew I was going to get to see him again because he had said yes to Christ. What I want to do today is I want to, I want to close in this same prayer, and I want you guys just to listen as I pray. You can bow your heads and listen. But if this prayer expressed the, the desire of your heart, I want you to know that you can know Christ today for sure. Some of you, I know what you're thinking because I've had this conversation so many times with you or with, with freshmen, and you'll say to me this. You'll say, Isaac, I hear what you're saying, and I want to know Christ, and I want to be 100% sure. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out, and I'm going to quit doing a couple things in my life, and I'm going to really clean up my life, and then I'll say yes to Christ. But let me use an illustration for you. Um, over the years, my favorite athlete of all time is Michael Jordan, and I've gone to see him play seven times over the years when he played for the Bulls. And there was this guy named Scotty Pippen that grew up in Hamburg, Arkansas, and he went to my sister's college, Conway. And when Scotty Pippen went, <laughs> went to the pros, nobody really knew much about him until he got this guy named Michael Jordan on his team. And you see, I believe Michael Jordan made Scotty Pippen a better player. I believe Scotty Pippen would have never won a championship unless Jordan got on his team. Jordan made him a better player. Now Scotty's known as one of the 50 best players of all time. In the same way today, You've got to say yes to Christ to get him on your team, and then he'll make you a better player. You see, um, there's some things that have happened in my life. Um, the day that I heard this message for the first time, I was really kind of embarrassed because I'd grown up in church, and it, I, it had just never made sense to me. And I prayed a prayer just like this, and nothing happened to me physically on the outside, but here's what happened to me on the inside. Within a few weeks, I started, I started changing in my heart towards my dad. You see, my dad and my mom had gotten divorced when I was eight, and I had a lot of bitterness and hate towards my dad. I felt like he'd abandoned our family, and I felt God calling me to forgive my dad just like Jesus had forgiven me for my sins. So I began to forgive my dad, and then there was another man in my life that I wanted to kill, and that was a man who attacked and raped my mom when I was in eighth grade. She left our house one day and went jogging. It was just me and my sister and I, and she never came back. And uh, so I, I helped my sister get ready. We went to school, we walked to school, and I got home later on that afternoon, and my mom was there with some friends, and she pulled me aside, and she was, I could tell she was really beaten up really badly, and she told me she'd been raped, and I didn't even know what that was. She had to explain to me what it was. And from then on, not only did she have, a, have an extreme fear of men, but I had an extreme desire to find and kill that man. But when I came to know Christ, you guys, I felt God calling me to forgive that man. And over the years, I forgave him. I feel that, that God's changed me in so many ways, but those are probably the two biggest ways he's changed me is I've forgiven my dad. My dad and I have a great relationship now, and I forgave that man. So in light of that, if you will right now, if you'll just bow your heads and pray along with me, and I'm going to close this in prayer. And like I said, this is a one-time decision. This isn't a prayer that we just pray every day. This is a prayer where you're saying, I want to get right with you, God, through Christ. And if that, this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, you can just simply uh, repeat silently along with me. It says this, Lord Jesus, I want to know you personally. Thank you for dying on the cross of my sins, for my sins. I open the door of my life, and I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life 
and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Lord, I thank you that you hear our prayers and that you answer our prayers. And if we prayed this sincerely today, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you've come into our lives and we're not dead anymore. We're alive in you. And I just thank you and I give you all the glory and the honor that you deserve in your name. Amen. I want to encourage you um, with a couple scriptures. And if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to a verse that I want you to read. And I want to uh, ask somebody to read it for us. It's 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. And when somebody finds it, would you just yell out the page? I know it's like, I can't even remember what page it is. It's uh, 1 John, and by the way, John wrote the Gospel of John, but you can go to the very end of the Bible, Revelation, and go back a couple books, and you'll find 1 John chapter 5. Say that again. 743. First, first John chapter 5, verse 11. 857. 857. Okay, I think 857 is right, okay? All right, can somebody stand up? And I want to, I want to use this verse to encourage you. I'll share one uh, final story, and then we'll be finished. Just to, I want to encourage you with this, uh, with this passage. Who would stand up and read it for us? Yeah, all right, go ahead. Uh -huh, yeah, just read real clearly and loud if you can. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this is the life in his, and this life is in his Son. He who, is in, who has the Son has life. And who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to tell you who believe in the name of the Son of, the Son of God so that you may have, so that you may know you have eternal life. Okay, that's a great passage. It says, he who has the Son has the life. Talking about eternal life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. And then he says, I write these things so that you may know. Men and women, you don't have to leave here today hoping or guessing or gambling that you have eternal life. You can know. And I want to tell you a quick story to really illustrate the way God sees you as his children. I don't know if any of you men have read the book Unbroken. It was a number one bestseller this past year. But it's a book about a guy who was shot down in World War II named Louis Samperini. And he survived 40 days on a raft in the ocean, only to be uh, uh, taken by Japanese and tortured for four years in a POW camp. And during that time, the commander of the camp would tell him regularly, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you today, Louis. But he never did. But they tortured him repeatedly. Finally, the war was over, and he was released and able to go home, and he was consumed with hate for that commander, and he had these terrible dreams. Well, his wife invited him to go hear the speaker named Billy Graham, and through hearing Billy Graham, he became a Christian, and just like Lewis, Lewis began to forgive those men who did those things. Just like me, I'm sorry, he began to forgive those men for what they did, and then one day he got this great idea. He said, you know what? I'm going to raise money, go back to Japan, and I'm going to share Christ with those men because they're in prison. So he flew back to Japan, and he went to the prison, and he said, I want all the prisoners to come together. And they'd gotten all the war criminals that they could catch and put them in this one big prison. And then he gets them in this room, and he shares Christ with them, and tons of them raise their hand and say they became Christians with him. And then he said this. He said, if any of you all were in that POW camp and you tortured me, I, I'd just like to meet up with you afterwards and shake your hand and hug you because I've totally forgiven you. So as it was over, these men began to come down front and he began to shake their hand and talk to them. And then he asked the question, what happened to the commander? Where'd he go? And uh, some of the men said, well, you know, he never got caught and he's hiding out in the mountains. And then Lewis said this, and it's one of the most powerful things I've ever read in history. I love reading a lot of history. My granddad uh, was in World War II, and I think it's really fascinating. And he said this. He said, if I met that commander one day, I wouldn't even bring up the war. I'd just ask him about his family. Maybe did he raise kids? Because when God forgives, he forgets. Isn't that amazing? So I want you to know today that if you stood before God right now, and, you, and he was asking you to come into his kingdom, and you said, hold on, God. I don't want to come in. You don't know what I've done. I believe God would say you're right because when I forgive, I forget. Uh, Psalms 103 verse 12 says, He has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. And Romans chapter 4 says, Blessed is a man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So I want you to be encouraged today. I don't want you to think that God looks on you with shame or madness or anger. I want you to know when he looks upon you as his child, he looks at you with love like I love my children. Okay, so when Tommy passed, 
our student leaders, imagine these guys right here getting, behind, getting excited about Tommy. And they, um, the more, you know, I told you he had the pledges read more than a carpenter. Well, they went out and raised money and we bought 10,000 more than a carpenters and gave them out on campus. And then the author of, of, uh, of the book named Josh McDowell gave me a call and he said, Isaac, it really sounds like God's doing something on your campus. And he said, can I help you out? And I said, sure, you can come here and speak. So we rented out the TAD pad and um, we showed Tommy's testimony on the Jumb Jumbotron and close to 4,000 college students came out to hear Josh McDowell speak. And um, Josh shared the same story I shared with you and 250 students wrote on their comment cards, I trusted Christ with you tonight, Josh. So in kind of a, a tradition, I want to ask you to do the same today. If you felt like you said yes to Christ today and you prayed, somewhere on the comment card, would you just say, hey, Isaac, I trusted Christ with you, okay? Or I prayed to trust in Christ. That way I, we can know, we can pray for you, we can follow you up, and we can answer any questions that you have about that.